I think it's important not to draw too direct a line from particular scriptural passages or teaching documents to narrow public policy positions. That offends people. But at the same time, it's true that faith can't be divorced from public life. To the, to the church, to the Catholic church, the fact that states exist to serve human persons necessarily establishes a connection between the moral and the social and political orders. Catholic teaching on human dignity has political implications. In the book, I write at length about how the Catholic church weaves together concepts like natural law and human rights and the common good and sovereignty to present a coherent framework um, on how to analyze the reality of migration. But of course, what links all of these concepts is, Catholic, is the Catholic reverence for the people at the heart of this phenomenon and the sense that abstract concepts like sovereignty and globalization need to serve human beings and not vice versa. So, who are immigrants? I think this is one of the fundamental disputes and issues in the immigration debate right now. Father Daniel Grudy in the, in the book draws powerfully on the image of, on, on the theme of the image of God. Immigrants are created in the image and likeness of God. They're the children of God. This is their deepest and their truest identity, and it's an identity far more profound than their immigration status. He cautions that while labeling may be an inescapable part of policymaking, the difficulty arises when migrants are identified principally and primarily in terms of their political status rather than their human identity. So, the Catholic Church's rejection of terms like illegal alien is not a quibble and it's not a semantic point, it's a line in the sand point. People can break the law, but God's children cannot be illegal any more than there can be illegal mothers or illegal fathers or illegal brothers and sisters. Nor, as Cardinal McCarrick likes to point out, are immigrants alien to the Judeo-Christian tradition. One of the strongest Old Testament themes involves identification with and love for migrants based on the Jewish people's own experience as migrants and displaced people. And the New Testament teaches us to welcome the stranger, not only because we were strangers, but because Christ identifies with newcomers and other people on the margins. Once we get past the labels, we can see that today's immigrants want what immigrants wanted in our nation's last great era of immigration from 1890 to 1920, when at the time, 75% of Catholics were foreign born. 75% of US Catholics foreign born. What immigrants want today is what your parents, your grandparents, and your great grandparents wanted, and they want what you want. They want to live in security, they want to support their families, they want to contribute to their communities and to their nation, and they want to practice their faith. A recent article on immigration, supposedly from a faith-based perspective, called Immigrants, and I quote, greedy and envious for wanting to come. Don't believe it. Most immigrants are self-sacrificing, hardworking, good people. Many model Christian charity like the Good Samaritan in Christ's parable. So this is how the Catholic Church views immigrants. It's not a view that leads directly to particular policy positions, but it sets the context for them. Let me talk briefly on rights, responsibilities, and the common good. There's a lot of groups out there that see migration through the lens of human rights, and the church does as well. But rights in the Catholic tradition always entail responsibilities and are always framed in terms of the common good. Those of you who attended parochial school or who grew up in Catholic households might remember the de-emphasis on individual rights in those institutions, right? And the, and the emphasis on responsibilities and the common good is defined by the leaders of those institutions. The Catholic Church teaches that states have a responsibility, responsibility to provide the conditions that allow their residents to live fully human lives and to flourish at home. But when states fail to meet their responsibilities and when their members, whether due to gross poverty or war or persecution or disaster, can't sustain themselves or their families, they have a right and they have a responsibility to seek better lives. And this right, if it leads to migration, creates a corresponding responsibility on behalf of states to welcome and to receive them. 
immigrants in turn have a right and a responsibility to contribute to the good of their new communities. This is a matter of justice. In fact, Catholic teaching refers to social justice by the term contributive justice. The common good, what does it mean? It doesn't mean the greater good or the good of a few. That kind of common good is not good, it's just common. Rather, the term speaks to the conditions that allow all persons in a community to thrive and to realize their potential. In 1986, the U.S. bishop said, it is against the common good and unacceptable to have a double society, one visible with rights and one invisible without rights, a voiceless underground of undocumented persons. In 2003, the U.S. and Mexican bishops wrote that while sovereign states may impose reasonable limits on immigration, the common good is not served when the basic human rights of the individual are violated. The great Archbishop Romero said, the common good will not be attained by excluding people. We can't enrich the common good of our country by driving out those we don't care for. As a practical matter, the bishops believe that allowing immigrants to advance in their studies, to work, to secure basic services, to obtain police protection, to participate, serve the common good. When I was working on the book, I received a testimony from a 17-year-old high school student in El Paso. She wrote to me, she said, throughout my academic life, there is diploma after diploma, trophy after trophy that symbolize my achievements. It was in seventh grade that I was accepted into the National Junior Honor Society at my school. I have also done some volunteer work in community service. I have gone to retirement homes and helped out there. I also help tutor elementary kids a couple of times a week after school. That is when I am not very busy with varsity soccer practices at school or at my city league team. Now I am 17 years old and have lived in America for more than a decade, for most of my life. I am a teenager who gives back to the community, but with every new law that Congress makes, it seems that they don't want me here. They would rather have kids that were born here and cause mayhem. They go over me just for the fact that I was conceived in Mexico, which is only a couple of miles away. I can't drive because I'm not allowed to have a driver's license. I can't travel out of town with school programs that I would like to participate in. And worst of all, I can't visit members of my family back in Mexico because there is no way for me to come back. My friends are now planning a trip out of town for graduation, and it seems like I'm going to be left behind. I would like to go on to college and continue my studies and become a productive member of society, but with every new law that is put against me, my dream seems that much further from happening. As the U.S. bishops see it, it would serve the common good of our nation if she were offered, she and others were offered legal status. What kind of country do we want? Our nation's receptivity towards immigrants, its attitude towards immigrants, in large part, determines, is determined by the, the kind of nation that we want to build. 